Ready. Good day, campers, and welcome to another Thursday night live around the campfire. Um, I just want to, before we get started, I just want to say thank you for last week to everybody who watched and passed comment because I truly feel like it was an amazing thing, and I, I was extremely excited and happy that I was in a safe place that I could actually talk about menstruation. So, and you know, tonight we've got two of the panelists from last week, um, Lisa Jane and Kylie Hutchinson. Uh, joining me with Omji tonight to talk about Kundalini. Kundalini is not something I know a lot about, but the three people sitting here with us today know a bit about Kundalini. So it's going to be you know, an interesting opportunity to learn. So tonight with us, Lisa Jane, co founder of uh, Bungie. Uh, she's a, a guest speaker. Sorry, I am struggling today. <laughs> we'll get there this little bit. There, and we've got Kylie Hutchinson. Death Dula and Omji, who's a radiographer uh, and into Kundalini physiology. So, what is Kundalini? Lisa, would you mind opening this up for us? I would love to open this up for you. However, I actually think that I might not be the best person to define it because my experience of Kundalini has been very experiential. Um, and it's not something that I've studied, it's something that I've just lived my life. And when I say just, not just. Um, however, it's not something that I probably would be the best person to describe. So can I pass it over to Omji? Because I reckon he might be a better person. <laughs> <laughs> the definition, because I would really hate to not give the best definition and mislead people. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Omji, open us up, please. Kundalini is the energy that runs up the central channel of your subtle energy system at the time and moment that you transcend the dualistic perspective of reality and have an ex direct experience of the non-dual. Okay. <laughs> for I'm just for the non-dual. Definition. Go, Kylie. Um, definitely an energy that runs up your uh, spine. Uh, starts at the bottom, goes up, down, up, and down. Um, Definitely feel has have felt that um, transcending. Yes, makes you for me made me feel like I was part of something greater. I could tap into a bigger energy than me. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm just. I'm just I'm <laughs> but okay, the jewel. Explain the jewel. So basically, there's a couple of things that happen in life, Scott. One is, let's say, for instance, we're in this carbon-based life form called a body that interacts and exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide to exist. We live in a dimension predominantly physically and psychological and emotional, and most of those dimensions have this experience of things that are on a spectrum of opposites. So let's say we have on and off, male and female, day and night, up and down, fast and slow. All of those experiences are in the in those dimensions. So that's what you call a dualistic experience when something you experience has an opposite and it's on a spectrum where whether it comes through the senses, through your rational mind or through your intuitive mind, most things have to do with a dualistic experience of reality. Yep. And there's one experience that happens which is called yoga. All the yoga techniques are designed for yoga. So the experience of yoga happens when you transcend what you would call in yogic philosophy the four lower koshas, which are the physical dimension, the energetic dimension, the rational mind dimension, the intuitive dimension. And then you can experience the underlying substratum of reality 
and submerge yourself in that. And that happens at the time of what they call yoga. And yoga comes from a Sanskrit origin, which means yuj, which means to unify. So at one precise moment in your life, God willing, or maybe yourself willing, um, you might be lucky enough to transcend the dualistic experience and land in the all-pervading unity of God. And that experience is also known, according to yogic philosophy, as the Jivan Mukti experience, which in Sanskrit, the individual soul is called the Jiva. And or the Jivatma, the individual soul. And then there's a great soul, universal being. Some people have termed this universal being called God. You can call it whatever you like. I don't really care. But there's a big thing that's larger than life and everywhere all at once. And that's called Paramatma, the great soul. And sometimes if you're fortunate enough, then your jivatma can experience the liberation or transcendence of the dualistic experience and land in the lap of paramatma and you can get off the cycle of reincarnation if you so desire according to the yogic philosophy could all be bullshit <laughs> but i'm backing on it <laughs> you know I'm, I'm all in i'm all in bro i think yeah. you I think this is awesome because if that's okay, I'd love to e e explain my experience because it's, it's all the same thing, but it's the way we describe it. And I think it's so cool when you hear somebody else's perception of something you've experienced. You know, I love that stuff. So, because I also think we hear, we all hear differently too, don't we? You know, so I, I understood Kundalini when I had done enough work on myself emotionally that I stopped resisting the truth or the life force or the love that I was. So when I actually went within enough and I had done this work on myself, I started to experience life and I see the kundalini energy as just a life, like, like totally switched on life force like intense bliss life force which keeps us alive and for me the more work that i did on myself the more i started to experience this in my everyday life so that some days i would feel like i was living on the edge of orgasm just walking around doing my everyday life and this energy that just and i could even remember feeling like i can't i have so much energy pumping through my body like what can I do with it like I almost didn't even know what I could do with it and of course that whole one of the things that actually I when I started to get in touch with it first was you know in, in love making because there's a point that I could feel the kundalini releasing and going up my spine and the whole energy moving throughout my body and that was a similar experience maybe not as maybe more um i don't know if i see i don't even have the right words for this this is just my experience but i do fully believe that the those sorts of experiences like that omji is describing for me um has come when i've actually done enough work on myself that i'm not fearful or feeling insecure um you know all those things that would resist me living the fullest potential of who i am in any moment anything in me that would resist the magnificence of who I am shining through in that moment. And if I'm addressing that and actually working with those emotions, fear and security that stops me from fully being who I am, then that the Kundalini I've found anyway, that that energy starts to naturally express through me. Okay. I don't know. That's yeah. Well, we're learning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, as far as I'm understanding, and I've done a little bit of research on it this week about everyone's experiences their own individual Kundalini and what it's about. So, Kylie, for you, what, what was it for you? Um, it was it was this 
awakening, almost like connectedness. It was just an incredible feeling of um, I am just I am so connected to everything. I, I felt part of something so much greater. And 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 yes, it, it can. Like Lisa said, now um, there was definitely some of this edge of orgasm energy that I was like, "What is that?" It's walking around in this semi blissful, <laughs> simmering kind of state, going oh, simmering. I like that. Simmering. simmering. It was just like this. Is great. <laughs> but it was it was, <laughs> it was, it was like wow, that's gorgeous. The rain is gorgeous, and the bushwalk is gorgeous, and the ocean is gorgeous, and you know everything. It was just noticing everything and just seeing and feeling like. I, I am part of this. I am not just existing on this earth and going to work and coming home. I'm just able to walk through and really notice everything, you know, just the rain on my face even. I can remember this bushwalk and it started to rain. And I was like, oh, I'll just keep going. The rain it was just incredible, incredible, beautiful. Do you think it's about actually like who we really are as beings, do you think Kundalini is just an experience that actually is something that we naturally could experience had we not been raised in hmm. the state hmm. we've been raised in, right? Do you think that that can be a natural state of being that we can access, like a power that we can access naturally? Yeah, I do. I feel that. That's how I feel it. Like there's this power there this connectedness for me and I could just tap into it if I wanted to but I had to do a lot of work on myself to get there and unlearn stuff mm. <laughs> so I reckon if we were conditioned in oh. I still understand it Kundalini is a feminine energy is that correct I think everyone has or, is it, or is it a dual energy I mean, uh, I'm you because you've experienced Kundalini, yes? I'd say so. <laughs> so, what is it from a male's perspective that you feel? Oh, you got to be careful when you lob human words onto concepts, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. According to yeah. the philosophy, you're talking about the predominance of what's embodied in the human structure could be the left side of brain and the right side of brain. It could be what males predominantly express and females predominantly express, you know. Like let's say energetically the man could be, well, let's tie it into where the origin of the philosophy comes from and that comes from the Tantra Shastras, right? So they talk about these two energies in our experience of life. One is the... Oh, supreme consciousness, which is pure space. It's without judgment and pure allowance. And that, according to the philosophy of yoga and tantra, is seen as Shiva. So what that is Shiva? Gets the pure awareness that is the substratum of existence that doesn't change and all pervading and it's the only thing that is seen as real on top and it's like the space in the bathtub. Do you want me to go into that analogy? Absolutely. The space Absolutely. in the bathtub, if you think about, this is from the Om David G School of Spiritual Neuroses, right? But this is some shit I made up and it sounds pretty good to me, so I'll tell you about it. The space in the bathtub, like if you think about the bath, right, it's got like four walls and a bottom and there's space in there and you fill the bath up with water, which is temporary, and then you jump in the bath and you do whatever you want in the bath and you can stay in there as long as you want, but the space is still there. The space hasn't changed. It's only contained within the five walls or the four walls and the floor, right? You get out, dry yourself or stay wet, I don't really care, but then you let the water out 
And for the whole experience, the space was there and didn't change. All it did was allow you to have the experience of the bath, right? So that's Shiva, bro. Right? According that's to the yogic right? philosophy, that's pure awareness. Yeah. Just fucking doesn't change, bro. It's just there. Yeah. Right? And allows the experience without interjection, anything to do with anything. Then everything, like that's called, when I mentioned the koshas before, there's five koshas and the dimension of the pure awareness is called the Ananda Maya Kosha. And that means the dimension of bliss. And some people tap into it. Like these girls said, right? It's a blissful experience. When you, you call, call if I call you girls and that, that we're all good. When, yeah, I love when it. They're <laughs> when they're experiencing like in that unified state, they're transcending the dualistic perspective of reality, right? So they're in a blissful state because, or they're tapping into that blissful dimension. So that blissful dimension is experienced in many ways, predominantly in a connected, peaceful way, psychologically or energetically, but also it comes through our system as the orgasm because physically that's the most pleasant experience we have and that's the closest, most blissful thing that we can relate to the dimension of that bliss. On one level, it's spiritual energy, which is in yoga terms called ojas. If you don't have the spiritual practices, like Lisa said before, if you don't have the spiritual practices, which this culture doesn't because it's in not indoctrinated into the economic work too much and leave your loved ones for the whole day and try and have a harmonious life without getting addicted to something because you're unemotionally fulfilled, if you don't have those spiritual practices, then you need to express that energy through sex or you'll go insane because it's like throwing broadband through your two-pair cable, which isn't geared up for it because of a lack of understanding and a lack of preparation for blowing your fibre op your broadband through your fibre optic when you've only got this fucking old phone cable that's not equipped to cope with such a voltage. <laughs> right? So you have to let it out physically, out the bottom end, because... Oh, that's cool too because we're in like this period of human incarnation which is like transformation in our psyche into the newer dimension and understanding of all these other subtle realms around us and our human potential. Um, so that shiver, that bliss, yeah. it's not like you don't, go into these neo-tantra realms where people are saying, the male teacher saying, I'm Shiva and you're Shakti, that's all bullshit, mate, because everyone's Shiva and everyone's Shakti, right? Because I've got the space to hold myself, but sometimes it's all right for other people to hold me in the expression of everything that there is. Shakti is everything that happens in the dualistic realm. Everything in creation, according to this philosophy, is known as feminine. Why is that? Everything. Because it's expressive. It fills up the space. It has the tendencies that are embodied through someone born with an XX chromosome set predominantly without virgin on being gender bias and all that sort of other bullshit that goes on these days but women in general or if you no not even women mate if i'm in my creative expressive um part of my brain hemisphere if i'm in my right side of brain which is equated to the feminine energy then i'm in an intuitive state i'm in a creative expression i'm in the flowman bro like and that flowman's trademark to the Om David G School of Spiritual Neurosis. So you can use it. you just got to, like, plug it. Right? But the flowman, right? So the feminine energy is the expressive part and everything that is experienceable within the human experience in general, right? Yeah. 
every everything else, the underlying substratum of reality is seen as pure awareness. Everything that moves on top of that is seen as the feminine. Thus, there's a reference because energetically in the subtle energetic system, which you can call whatever, but in Sanskrit it's called the Linga Sharira, energetically the Kundalini is seen to circle at the base of the um, etheric system, which is in the what they call the base chakra, Muladhara chakra, energetically it's been perceived by the Munis and the seers of the past as a Shiva Linga, and the Kundalini energy is wrapped three and a half times around that Shiva Linga. When the experience of yoga happens and your Kundalini is awakened, then it's pretty detailed sort of shit. But we're talking about a ladder of consciousness that is to is symbolized by our medical symbol, right? Or the Garden of Eden story analogy that's also an analogy of the kundalini energy all right but well let's go on a tangent along that line the medical symbols got these it's called the staff of hermes trismegistus or the caduceus all right you can see it on the side of the ambulance you can see it on the paramedic's shoulder you can see it everywhere to do in medicine and there's a staff up the middle, and then there's two serpents that go like this, and they cross over six times and come to a point, which is a circle at the top, right? The circle at the top represents physiologically, like it's tied into our system, but physiologically, I'll slow down a little bit. Physiologically, that dot at the top of the medical symbol represents the hypothalamic pituitary axis or basically where your pineal gland sits. That's why everyone worships the pine cone because that's associated with the pineal gland, right? That place in your skull, which is like in between there and in between there, yeah. that's relative. The third eye, that's, that's why Shiva's called the third eye God because that's open on him. But that's called, that's where you become aware of the unified reality. That's where Shiva resides. It's close to what they call the fourth ventricle in your neurological system. It's tied in to affect the glands and the nerves and stuff. But you need to have the bout that as these serpents cross over, they represent the chakras. And the chakras are your ladder of consciousness that is within your being that is responsible for your own perception and your own expression of reality and your own inner consciousness. It can be called Jacob's Ladder. It can be called the Bridge of Consciousness. I don't give a toss what you call it, but it's sitting inside your body. It's secretly represented. No one knows. I work in the medical industry, mate, and not one doctor in that hospital knows that it's the staff of Hermes Trismegistus and represents um, a yogic symbol that was taken from India to, by Alexander the Great to Greece to create the word therapy when they took the doctor called Theravadam. No one knows that sort of shit, but, or some people do. But anyway, but, that system has to do with the way balancing and harmonising your chakras so once they're balanced, your hemispheres of your brain are balanced and the energy shoots off of the Shiva Linga in the base of your body and shoots up the central channel of what you call the staff going up that medical symbol. So it ends in that globe before it blows out into the wings and you become an avatar or a godlike being incarnate. So would that be like the reason for that, like tying that into medical and healing? Could I translate that as when we do enough work on ourselves to get the Kundalini <laughs> energy working as in that symbol, then every part of us is becoming healed and becoming um, rejuvenated and invigorated with a life force and we become who we really are meant to be in this body? 
in a healthy interpretation, it would be the most optimal. But as I understand it, I don't know, like all the yoga sages and that, they die of something, you know. So there's all this stuff to do with karma and your own sort situation as to which one to be blocked and how you wish yourself as well. But I certainly agree with you, Lisa, in regards to... Yeah, because I, I was just thinking in a practical sense, like why, why would it benefit people to even understand Kundalini, you know? And so for me, if that's a... If, that's even represented secretly within the medical fraternities because personally I think that it keeps me healthy and young and builds my immune system and my ability to um, feel that energy more and more in my body and and be in that essence absolutely helps my health. Yep. So it doesn't surprise me that it's, represented there even though there's not really um, an awareness around why it's represented there. So Sounds I guess what I'm saying is thinking yeah. practical, and I don't know, maybe Kylie, you've got more to say on this. It's like the practical, you know, if we're in a human body and we want to be able to access that energy or that power, like how could people actually do that? You know, like what I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Like, how could you make it a practical thing for people to be able to use that healing energy? So, with Kundalini, there's there's yoga. Can you hear the question? Sorry, Sorry? was that a question? It was, yeah, okay. I'm just checking that she got it. Oh, for me, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. for me, um, how can people access it? Well, I just, I, I was just thinking, like, you know, like, obviously, Omji studied it for ages. Like, that, for me, that sort of knowledge, like, I don't have that sort of expertise in Kundalini at all. Yeah. But for me, I go, okay, I'm in a human body. How can I access that? And, and why would I want to? You know, how could I make that work for me? You know, how could I use, utilize Omji's experience and your experience too, Kylie, to actually, make it a benefit to me in my life you know like why would we even want to know about this perfect um because it's fun (laughs) 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 to start with uh, there is a balancing um for me and then this was just my understanding of it and and when omji was talking about the two snakes that intertwined i saw that as when I first looked into it, um, I saw that as as what would be called feminine and masculine energy, and and having them in balance in your life, and and coming to that point, um, just meant that for me I was able to swap between it and go maybe it's left brain, right brain, maybe it's that, maybe it's it's feminine, masculine energy, whatever you want to term that. Um, for me, I. I felt comfortable with feminine and masculine energy and and having them in balance and knowing at this point I can pull on this energy for that or I can use this or in this situation I should come at it with this kind of energy rather than, than that one. Um, and I just found it just gave me a bigger toolbox to draw from really and in all sorts of situations. Sometimes you just, you know, need to come at it a different way and being able to come at it from utilise that energy that's in another side, of your, another side of your brain or another way of coming at something just helps you, helped me overcome things I felt it has, yeah. Did that answer it, Lisa? Yeah, sure. So you couldn't do any work. I was Kundalini thinking. awakening is a <laughs> go, go Lisa, <laughs> sorry, I must have lost connection. Come through. I was just going to add on to what Kylie was saying about using it. And I thought if we want to get very explicit here, one of the things that I've found is at that moment of orgasm using the energy as you, you can actually build your awareness to feel the, that energy in that moment and 
use it and send it up into your body and out into your cells and like actually use the power of that energy because I loved what you said, Omji, about this is when we don't know what to do with it, it explodes out of us, you know, because we build it up. But if we consciously start to use that energy to feed ourselves and to send it into our body, like that's, and I don't even know if I'm even on the same topic of Kundalini here, but I found that's pretty beneficial, you know. I don't know. Maybe I'm totally sounds, off topic. Sounds pretty, <laughs> no, it sounds pretty good. And there's a lot of this taken out of context, but you didn't take it out of context. But there is a lot of this experience where people are talking about manifestation. And the easiest way to manifest anything, because ultimately, why do you want to know about this stuff, Lisa, in, a, in an average, everyday context? First yep. of all, because it gets you, it's the goal of human incarnation, just quietly. It's not that serious. It's the reason why everyone incarnated on the planet to realise that they're in some cosmic masturbation where they're playing with themselves until they realise that themselves are reflected in everyone and that they're everything, if that makes sense. But the energy itself to manifest, the best way to manifest is when you're in your high vibrational state and that is can be equated to the orgasmic state when you've lost yourself in the act of sexual intercourse then you do something that is not very common if you're aware of that state you can tap in to what is known as the causal plane and in that you can be a godlike being that is able to create things almost immediately because that's the latent potential of the human framework. And the chakras themselves are designed around this ladder of consciousness where you deal with things that are physical and then move into the what they away from the physical plane into the subtle plane and then ultimately land in the causal plane. But you can bypass all of that stuff and go and have wicked, awesome intercourse. As long as you've got the right awareness in that peaked state, then you can manifest things. The only thing is, if you do it in a controlled way, like according to the Gurukul tradition that used to be in ashrams over a 12 year period under the guidance of a qualified guru, if you do it the new way, then you might not have been able to harmonise all your other chakras and when you manifest things, it might be some selfish indulgence. But that's cool too because that's still karmically just. But with the ladder of consciousness going up your spine, then maybe it's best to focus on our primal needs in a healthy way and then our connection and intimacy in a healthy way because if it's unhealthy, we've got a culture like we have now where it's like, weird mate sexually don't get me wrong i've participated well in the weird shit to do with an imbalanced second chakra right but i'm coming from experience and the third chakra is to do with personal power and strong boundaries and self-respect and then you unlock this knot called brahma granti on the way up jacob's ladder come into your heart and then you reside in your heart and you really wonder instead of, because you, by that time, if you open your heart according to the subtle energy system and your energy in your heart, then you've transcended the physical reality and you know that that's not the most important thing. If you're in your heart, then you question your identity to do with your emotions and your thoughts and wonder if that's really you. So then you get to another point which you unlock another knot which is called Vishnu Granti, which is around here, just above the um, Vishuddhi Chakra, your throat. And you contemplate whether you, your thoughts and all that subtle shit. So you're in your subtle plane there, which is like all this energy that's real fast and vibrating and it's not seen or physical. And then you get to a point where you go, okay, well, I'm not my body, I'm not this physical stuff. 
I start speaking the truth according to a unified perspective, and then you get to a point where you go, am I really separate from anything? And God willing, if you're focused enough on that separate on not being separated from anything, then you undo the third knot, which is called Rudra Granti, which if you unlock that, you're basically in a whole world of shit because you transcend reality and then after your orgasm or after your meditation or whatever, you got to come back to a world and function in a way that's healthy around people that have no idea about the unified reality and it hurts. But there's several levels and once you undo that top knot and you realise that you're not separate from anything, then you end in the causal plane and that's where you can manifest things at will and that's why the Kundalini experience is so tied into magic at the moment and also there's a whole lot of shit going on that I don't even need to mention on this phone call on this um what do you call it? podcast but let's just say <laughs> when the consciousness is unified with everything then you can play with it and you can create anything you want because that's why we're here and if we had that back on your other question about like a long time ago um would our life be different if we were educated in a healthy way hell yeah it would be mate if if you got a kid that was conditioned into the reality that they're unified and um, have the potential to tap into the causal realm from the from the day dot, and then they grow up knowing that everyone's a reflection of themselves. And the best way to express life is through a harmonised expression of their subtle energy system through healthy primal needs, healthy connection, um, balanced power, um, love that's conditional in the sense that it doesn't get exploited speaking the truth as far as the unified reality goes and then seeing the truth as far as the unified reality goes that kid will grow into some i don't even want to use superstar because that's all bullshit hollywood terms you know the kid will be a known avatar which is a godlike being which is incarnate in the human form and that's the future that we're going towards. Mm. Yeah. And is it fun? I haven't. I've found a little bit of fun, but I've found heaps more pain than I have fun. <laughs> that, because that's that's. Yeah, yeah. You have to face your pain to get it. You have to face yeah. your pain to get. But there's light at the end of the tunnel. I, I didn't get it after facing the pain. I got it, and then the pain faced me. Yeah. Yeah. That I didn't too. ask for it. It just happened. And that's that where I come in and I go, poor bastards in the psych wards, they're all experiencing this non-dual reality, going to the hospital going, oh, man, God's everywhere. And people are going, mate, you're off your head. Take some high-end lithium and antipsychotics and come back to reality. And they've just experienced the ultimate reality and they're getting toned down because spontaneously they flipped into some non-dual perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I think Scott was going to ask. This has been extremely interesting. Is this yeah, what you're? Because well, this is probably a good spot for that. I yeah. think I was referring to that then. Yeah, which chasing chasing Kundalini, like, because for me it's something that I don't know a lot about, and like I'm clearly sitting back here going, "What is this about? Where's this conversation going?" I've got two women that have experienced bliss in a in a beautiful way where they're orgasmic at just walking through it, you know. <laughs> And then I've got you know, I'm sitting here and he's, he's, he's experienced Kundalini, but it's brought about pain. So why why would you chase, for, for my word, like a nirvana? What's what's the purpose of chasing that nirvana? Like anybody? I don't think it's chasing nirvana. I think it's yeah. anyway. I think it's about integrating the physical and human experience into the nirvana that I am. So for me, it's like being fully here, like every part of me is here in this experience, absolutely enjoying the engagement of life, which yep. involves kundalini, it involves everything. So for me, it's not about somewhere I'm getting to, it's about right now integrating every part of me in the here and now. 
so that my yeah. experience is optimal. And, and for me, you, that's one of the reasons. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, very much so. Because that's love. Yeah. That is love. That is love for who we are. That is love for who you are. That is love. Yeah. That is pure love. So that, that's that's fascinating to me because I, I I don't truly understand Kundalini, but I've I find myself in a state of just heart space because I've sat and I've gone through a fair bit of stuff in my life and I just completely accept it. And the three of you know, I come come to you with this, this heart of wanting to understand and, and and learn. So Kundalini for me is another thing that I really want to understand because like I'm just reading now, you know, like it's possible to find acknowledgement of a spiritual movement in many yogic and chantic traditions. Tantric Buddhism, Taoism, Gnostic mystical tr tradition, and some Native American teachings. And I'm wondering whether or not the Aboriginals had a form of it as well. So because it's Hell yeah. I, no, I want to learn more. They did? Yeah, the Australian Aboriginals got this something this thing called a rainbow serpent. Yeah, the chakras are equated yep. with the colours of the rainbow. In Lisa's picture in the background, right, it starts at red. The density of these vibrations of your bridge of consciousness goes up, right, like the rainbow. The thing that goes up this middle is the serpent bow, right? The serpent, according to the Aboriginal philosophy, is the bridge between the human state and the dream time. So that's a, the bridge between the physical reality and the spiritual realm. Mm. Yeah, it's all the same shit. That's why I'm a physiologist and not a every anything else. Because the staff of Hermes Trismegistus is the same staff that Toth had in Egypt. He's known as the god and the messenger of death, right? Or the afterlife. Or yeah, not the afterlife because that's Anubis, right? But Toth is a scribe of the spirits. It's the same as Mercury. He's the same geezer, mate. With the wings of the caduceus or the staff of Hermes Trismegistus, right? And he's holding a staff. It's all the same shit. Ties into the human framework, and it's physiologically capable for every human being, God willing, maybe not every human being, but <laughs> because maybe they've incarnated in a body that's not capable of that sort of thing. So you, you can't say every human being because that's a bit grandiose, right? Maybe next time round or something they can be in a functional body. But there's some people that don't have a functional body, as, as sad as that could be or as divine as that could be, yeah? But they all knew about it. Well, it depends how far our history goes back, Scott. You yeah. know, there's a, there's a time if you believe in Atlantis, Maybe pre-Atlantis there was a unified reality and the Vedic scriptures talk about this um, period where there's godlike beings on the planet and there's riches throughout the world, right? Who knows? Our history is a bit skewed, but physiologically you can't fault it, mate. Yeah. So is Kundalini where we're heading as a, as a society and as, as a growth no. as human beings? Not at the moment. We're heading where you are, Scott, which sort of irritates me a bit, but it's all cool. Explain we're me. Heading, so, so where am I? <laughs> we're heading. <laughs> we're basically unlocking the first grantee, you? mate. You and your lounge room in the campfire, bro. But that's yeah, cool. yeah. Right? But you're doing, you're, you're a pioneer in regards to collectively humans are unlocking the first knot on the ladder of consciousness, which is above the third chakras, third chakra, right? It's called the Brahma Granti, and it happens when you realise that all this physical separation, all this bullshit to do with nations and cultures and everything like that, it's where you come into this love, sort of so to do with this thing called the Star of David and the Merkaba, where energetically the spiritual dimension hits the physical dimension and you live this unconditional love, you've got way more unconditional love than me because I don't trust anyone, bro. So, But that's where we're going. We're going into this unlocking 
of this Brahma Granti so we can express love for the fellow human and we realise that we're not this race and that race, but we're the human race. And that human race shares a planet and we can share the world, right? Why would you want this experience? The reality is there's a couple of hurdles. First one is the desire to awaken your Kundalini is actually a hurdle that inhibits the awakening of the Kundalini, as stated by Patanjali, because <laughs> desire is actually self-motivated, all right? I don't want to be powerful. I don't want to be a god, man. At the end of the day, it all ends in service. I just want to be a servant to this magical language called Sanskrit that resides deep in my core, in my subtle energy system that no one else can see because they don't take x-rays and know that we're like all these atoms that are thrown together at certain frequencies to make up this blob of human energy that interacts with other humans through their need for validation on a subconscious level. But it ends in service. So you're in a good spot, man. You're in your heart, and that's what's happening to the human race at the moment. Open in your heart. I think it just goes to show how incredibly complex yeah. our human existence is. Like there are so many layers to us. And like the more I know myself and I have a relationship with myself, the more I discover these dimensions to me, which I didn't even know existed. And like that blows my mind. I feel that myself. Like I'm sitting back and like tonight I'm, I'm a bit lost in, you know, on this depth that I think a lot of people wouldn't understand. And it's, and it's, I have some parts of it, but I'm enjoying listening and taking on the knowledge that you have because I truly believe that all of our experiences, no matter what they are, combined together to give us our eternal journey. So I've got a question to the three of you. And something that's in my mind, if, if, if love is our, 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 the essence of who we are and what we can give and that bliss comes from just loving anything, and love's an act, it's not feeling. So in my eyes, has love been corrupted? <laughs> I <laughs> Go. Has it? Take it away, girls. You know my thoughts on that, Scott. Well, I want to find it. Go for it. I believe that pure love is our essence and I think it existed between all of us a long time ago. I think it has been corrupted because I think the way that we love now and the way we've been raised to love and taught to love is not pure. We withdraw our love if we don't get our emotional needs met. Um, we love determined on conditions being met. Um, we have needy love. We love within a framework that's very limited and has fear and insecurity around it. Mm. Pure love, I, I, I felt for the first time at 37 and I recognised it as a memory deep inside of me. So I had, an, I had a family too. I loved my kids immensely, but I didn't actually experience this incredible purity of love until I was 37. And that, I, I don't, I mean, that was part of my Kundalini awakening, actually, um, if we want to tie it back into the topic at hand. Yeah. But I do, I really do feel that this is part of our emotional evolution is really investigating where we um, we hold ourselves back from loving each other in a very pure way. I actually think that we almost need to relearn it because we have um, dynamics of relationship that uh, where the love, I believe, is quite corrupted. And that's because we try to hoard it. It's because we think we have to get it from outside of ourselves and yet we are the source of infinite love it is this energy that flows through us and it was only because 
people started to hoard it and they thought they'd run out and they'd lose it and they wanted to hold on to people, they wanted to hold on to it. And then it all just just changed. Oh, my- that, that's really interesting. It's like, I mean, like I've had conversations with Kylie about just that love, that beat in your heart that just, you know, it's, you know, do you have to love one person? No. You know, like, and that's something for me that I've learned over time. Like, if, it's funny because the three of you have said, mentioned to me that I've got this big heart and, and I love. You go back six, six years ago when my one of my best mates told me he loved me and it took me three months to accept that and I was so angry with him because he told me he loved me. <laughs> How dare he? Good on him. Like, I was angry, properly angry. And, I, and so, <laughs> Kylie, I'd love, I'd love to know your your feeling about love and does it tie into Kundalini for you? Yes, um, I, I think the same as Lisa. Love is, is used and bantered around a lot and said, but I'm doing this out of love or I'm doing this because I love you and I was like, it's um it's not pure love there's um yeah there's love and and then there's pure love it's different and it is i think it has been corrupted and 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 lisa's right uh, I, a lot of people i meet seem to think that there's a limited amount they can only give it to this one person or they can only give it to uh, this person if they do this for them and they get something back uh, very few people just give love without expecting anything in return. They just just give it, and um, and and I think that's where it has become corrupted and changed. And how does it relate to Kundalini? Because yep. that is is a, for me, it's it's pure love. That's how I would describe it as feeling to me. Okay. Yep. So when did you realise that you could just love unconditionally? Because you do. I do. I do. Yeah. Um, I don't know when I realised. I think I've always done it, but I have been told that I shouldn't. I've been shoulded. I have been shoulded a lot. <laughs> I shouldn't do this. <laughs> or I shouldn't do that. I should settle it down or I should settle down or I should not say this or not say that. Um, so I, I don't know when I really realised it. I can't remember a moment. Um, definitely the last few years has, has been a big awakening for me. Um, yeah. But I think I've always just loved like that. But not everyone likes it. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting thing because you've got to be able to accept love, and yeah. I think that's a whole other part of it because we're so busy trying to figure out what love is that we don't actually know how to accept it. In my case, yeah. and I don't think you can love give it until you love it. it. Yeah, I think you've got to love yourself yeah. first. Yeah. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> Omji, can you share experience love, Kundalini? Um, I'd probably have a deviant perspective on re- this in yeah. regards to just being not normal. Um, I'm a bit sketchy on the word love, like I see it as a commodity, like Lisa said. It's played. And sometimes when I'm totally in the experience of love, I don't think that the word love can actually express the experience itself. Mm. It's just a term that I fumble around, but there's no, when I'm in that unified state, then... I like to call it more like the space in the bathtub, an experience of pure being and subsequently me appreciating that I am a human 
being or I am being human and that's pure being, which is the same as the girls are saying, unconditional love, but I'm not up to that level of unconditional love. I'm at a place where I like emotional regulation. I like energetic respect for myself. I don't want to be at work around the narcissistic bullies and think, I just love you, you're beautiful, and this is the feedback that I'm getting in life at the moment by sending out this signal that's creating this feedback. I don't want to sit there and use that term. I sit there and use a different term, but that's not suitable for this PG broadcast, you know. <laughs> On some level... I think that's a like, misconception, though, because I think that love, like pure love, doesn't accept unacceptable behaviour. Yeah, that comes down to self-love and yeah. self-love. I don't even know if it's self-love because the love word's like God. It's like taken out of context. I think it's like self-care so I can function at my optimal and that aggressive energy doesn't stick to me because I'm health sensitive and I need to regulate what exposure I get from other people rather than accept everything. Because with the term unconditional love, I think that you can have poor boundaries and to me, loving or caring for yourself can involve, like, strong boundaries. And also I think, like, you know, I don't know Kylie, but the other two people on this call, we were intimate, right? Yeah. So we're intimate not physically, but when we interact, there's no facades, mate. I let you people into my soul. When normally I've got so many facades around me that protect my vulnerability because I don't trust anyone. But I check people out, such as yourselves, to go, are these worthy? Are these intentions pure? Because I ain't letting them near my vulnerability unless I can test them and check out that they're not going to hurt me because I don't want to be hurt anymore and I don't give a fuck if it's like to do with avoiding pain. It's more to do with... No, mate, you're not coming near my soul if you're a bastard or you're scumbag. But that intimacy, I let people into that. So, so there's that sort of love as well, you know. Like, is that love? Yeah, I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? That's emotional evolution, on you. I think you know that. Yeah. I put myself in a position to be hurt, and I don't trust everybody because I know that you can only trust the God in people, you know, or the that pure love in people. And a lot of people aren't operating from that place. Hmm. So it's yeah. actually very wise. Like and we're in this consumed life. culture. Yeah. We're in a culture that consumes and most of the energetic interactions are parasitic where one feeds on the other. I don't want that. I want the symbiotic experience of lichen where a fungi and a moss grow simultaneously and both thrive, hmm. you know, so you're both uplifted at the end of the interaction. Also, I'm, I like myself to a certain extent. I still feel sorry for myself sometimes, but I like validation on a subconscious level. So I'm choosy and I like to be around people that I said to Scott the other day, I said, I like you, man, because you like me. Not because you like me, because you are like me and you're, so, you're sensitive and you're humble. And you're intelligent and you're intense. And that, to me, gives me a fist pump in my sub psyche. He goes, yeah, bro, this bloke's the same as me. So I can be safe with this guy because he's not threatening to everything that I represent or my identity. So it's not like me to give a short answer, but that's my interpretation of unconditional love. My love comes with conditions. And if you're full, then... Keep walking, mate. But is that not just the whole point of it? Because there is, there is no short answer for anything. Like, and for me, the campfires prove that over and over again. Every time we open up a conversation, it's you know we we get to the hour mark, and then we start finding the real, true essence of a conversation. You know, like it takes time. It takes nothing short. If you shorten it and you cheat it. You're going to get that band-aid approach, whereas you're not getting into the depth of it. Like tonight, we've come in to talk about Kundalini, and we're back into love. You know, a place of 
It all ends in love, I, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, even at the start, when we were talking about the Kundalini experience with both Lisa and Kylie, I sat there and just looked in your eyes and just the love of that feeling, that bliss, you could feel it. You were there with it. And it was just amazing. So, look, we've gone past the hour and, you know, like, to be honest, it went deep tonight and, and Omji's opened up opportunities that I didn't quite understand and I'm going to find out more. So on that tonight, I'm just going to ask everybody for not necessarily one bit of advice tonight. Just give everybody one opportunity that you think they might take on to help them find their to help them find their place of heart. Kylie, throw it on the spot. <laughs> um, follow your passion, I think. If you follow your passion, you will find find your way. Um, it, there's it's always learning, and there's always lessons in it. But I think if you're um, if you just want to find what you love doing and keep doing it. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, I agree, Carly, because I think it's almost like, for me, it's building a relationship with who I really am. Like, I would recommend that highly. If you have yeah. a feeling, why am I feeling that? If I'm feeling agitated, why am I feeling that? Why am I yeah. being a person when I get this subtle sense of being put down? Or what? But it's like building the relationship with myself, which then means I understand myself emotionally. And then I also get in touch with my purpose. And then I also get in touch with my truth. And then things start to happen. My like kundalini starts to open up. And my experience of life gets bigger. And so everything comes. Up. And if you think about it, we are in every experience that we have. So if we yeah. want to have a kundalini experience, make us the best we that we can be to be there. Like it's almost like, yeah. it's sort of like that core of everything is just, investigating who we are, yeah. going with the feelings. What is it? Inquiring. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Omji. My advice is that every person that you interact with is on the spectrum of self-reflection. So everyone displays to you an attribute of human expression that you can choose to embody or not choose to embody, but they're all you. Perfect. <laughs> Scott. I, I, Scott. Sorry, Colin. I said, Scott, you looked confused. You're like. No, no, I'm good. Like, it's it's funny, you know. Like, for me tonight, it's, I'm pretty much the same, you know. Like, it's I'm questioning myself, you know, where am I chasing Kundalini? Is it something that I'm being a part of? Is it something that, you know, I want to find out more about? Yes, it is. So, for myself, open as many doors as you can. You can always shut them. Yeah. I want something that fits. It's normally the last key on the ring that fits the lock. So try it. So basically, the experience on that we've had we've had a comment. Awesome. It's trying to replicate all that MDMA and ecstasy and DMT and all that sort of shit that everyone's chemically in ingesting. That's what the Kundalini experience is going to do, is the real deal of the yeah. ecstasy. And you can yep. have it. You might as well go. You can go down the neo tantra path if you want, Scott, and go and have sex and blow firecrackers out your ass. It doesn't matter. But the orgasm will but ultimately okay. unify your reality when you lose yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to finish on that because I think that's pretty accurate. <laughs> so, look, to everyone watching tonight, it was a. Uh, it was an interesting conversation and 
I've learned tonight and I want to thank everybody. Thank Omji, thank Kylie and thank Lisa for joining me for thank you, you know, a, a, an interesting conversation and I feel it's going to be one that's going to be had a lot more in the future. So, yeah. I hope so. so thank you, guys. Thank you, campus. Um, have a great night and we'll see you next Thursday. We're going to have a go at dad jokes next Thursday. Um, so oh, do man. some homework. Get your dad jokes out. Let's, let's have a giggle. Let's do something a bit different. I want to see Omji give me a dad joke. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, anyway, well, take care. The, uh, over the next few weeks, I'm going to put up some new panels. Um, feel free to jump on top of them. I'm going to start putting up topics, uh, and then we're going to attack them as they come in. And, you know, look, I'm so grateful for everybody that jumps onto the panels. And Lisa and Kyle and Omji, you've been a part of them lately, and I'm so grateful that you are. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful Thank night, you. and we'll see you next week. Oh, oh, just go. See you, bro. See you, bro.